Good afternoon. September 29, 1910, the National Urban League was formed. The entire purpose of this organization was to allow for African Americans and marginalized communities to be economically empowered, to have social justice and parity. Well, it's 2021, and those issues still exist. So our organization exists. My name is Calvin Guidry. I'm chairman of the Houston Area Urban League. We're here today to talk about social justice and education. We're extremely proud of what we're doing in the area. But specifically, what we have done here in the Houston area since June 19, 1968. Over the past 50 years, we have contributed to this community as it relates to economic empowerment, social and, and economic parity, but in particular, allowing individuals to be self-sustaining as they meet, move forward towards their highest potential. Well, given today's social unrest, uh, the injustices that we see are formulating every day, it is time for us to do more. We're doing more by creating new initiatives and opportunities for all of you to participate in. We have the Center for Social Justice and Education. It's new. Just opened it a few months ago. We are reintroducing it to you today. What we have to do is thank our sponsors, though. All of you are here today, all of the participants, both in person, uh, social media, even Zoom, we want to thank you all. But we have corporate sponsors that we are going to thank specifically. I hope everyone understands the desperation in my voice as it relates to where we are today and what it is we need to do to sustain not only what we have accomplished, but to continue to accomplish social parity as it relates to the disenfranchised. That's what we do. That's what we're asking you to help us with. So again, welcome everyone. In particular, I have to welcome Zandwe Mandela, Zandwe Mandela, and the Mandela Legacy Foundation. It's such an honor to be here with him that uh, I'm a little shaky. I've met a lot of celebrities in my life, but only this man did my son. You better take a picture with him. <laughs> only one. So I'm, I'm not only proud, privileged, but I'm honored. Thank you so much for being here. We appreciate the opportunity to collaborate with your organization and, and looking so forward to contributing to our South African brothers and sisters. Mr. Robinson. Thank you, Chairman Guidry. We are so fortunate to have your leadership as well as the board and the vision to bring the Center for Social Justice and Education to light. We're thankful that we have companies like Asurian who are partners with us here today, who are actually the bridge to this discussion even being possible so that the center could be a place, a forum whereby we can dialogue, we can learn from each other, we can explore new ideas and make sure that we're on the path to a greater society of social justice and education. In addition to assuring we want to thank our original sponsors who were there from day one, PNC Bank, NRG, Wendy's, United, Cadence Bank, Coca-Cola, Metadata, Marathon Oil, Sempra Energy, and individuals like Jack and Anna Maria Moore. And of course, Calvin Guidry. You know, it's uh, not every day that you get to say that you're gonna have a guest 
like the Mandela's to be a part of your program. When you think about people who change the world, who change the way we think and the way we approach things, who do the seemingly impossible, you have to be honored to know that they've chosen the Urban League to be a partner in that discussion. We're simply honored. Zanwa, we're, we're simply honored, sir. Um, carrying the legacy of responsibility is a privilege and a burden. But when you take the privilege and focus on the privilege to change and impact the world, then the burden becomes oh so lighter. So today, we look forward to having this robust discussion. And I want to uh, welcome our, our moderator up, Mr. Eric Giddy, to uh, take us from this point forward. I know that we'll also have, we're going to also have uh, Rick Martin from Assur Assurian, excuse me, to speak as well. Do we want to do him at this point? Okay. Rick, the floor is yours, sir. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Hudson. My name is Rick Martin. I'm with Assurian. Uh, if you're not familiar with Assurian, we have a, a, a significant presence in the Houston area, but we are the uh, uh, largest device uh, warranty and just technology protector in, in America. But I would like to start by saying we're proud to be a sponsor and uh, with the Urban League and CCI Global, we thank you, each and every one of you for uh, participation. Our relationship with the Urban League is really a part of a, sh a larger call to action in, in regards uh, uh, to social justice and education. It spurred from the murder of George Floyd and really the right for uh, racial equity and social justice reform. Uh, we as a company, we need to do more and that we had, uh, while, while we had social justice efforts that were going on, uh, it was time, we, we knew that it was time for something a little bit more broader, that the normal efforts just weren't working. Um, it, you know, and we also realized that we as a company wanted to do more be put intentional focus on our black employees and the black community. Um, and that just show, and when we, I, I want to make it clear that while we know that we, we needed to do more, we didn't select the Urban League by accident. The Urban League was one of over 200 organizations that were on our initial list to partner with. And while we filtered through those lists and looked at organizations based off the criteria, one thing that stood out is that Urban League matched our values, what they're doing in the community already, uh, how they're impacting the community, and really aligned with every objective that we wanted to meet. Hence, that's the reason we're here today. So our $1 million investment in the Urban League over a five-year period will really be uh, for us to put emphasis on workforce development and continued education. Uh, and we see this as a company as more than writing a check. And our employees are excited about the input, the participation and the impact we together can have in the community. I'm hopeful that this is the first of many of our engagements together and excited about what the future uh, holds for us. And we're all excited about recording and sharing this opportunity and the conversation with Mr. Mandela with our employee base. So I look forward uh, uh, to more of this, hearing this, uh, um, uh, this conversation, but also look forward to more partnerships with us in the future. And with that, I'll turn it over to Eric Goody from the Houston area, Urban League.
worst day of my life was when we got kicked out of the other house, the second house we were living in. Uh, it was, yeah, it was the worst. I, yeah. Um, you know, seeing my mom cry and my dad being upset and my little sister king. So there wasn't even a decision-making process. It was just instinct. It was almost on instinct that, you know, I have to do something, I have to help out. Africa is a beautiful continent, but there is also great struggle in its beauty. Every year, millions of Africans graduate into our workforce with high ambitions for a better life. And without meaningful training and job vacancies, this is an impossible dream. It is time to focus on solutions. Today, we embrace and celebrate a solution with the power to positively influence our future. CareerBox impacts many lives, not just by creating sustainable jobs, but providing skills to previously disadvantaged youth to equip them for the working world, both locally and internationally. Mandela Legacy chose Career Box because we have these shared values. In very many ways, what it is that they are trying to do, we're trying to achieve. You know, I have a dream, and that dream is to take care of my mother. I want to take care of her like she took care of me. So what we do here at Career Box is we partner with government, the private sector, and philanthropy to provide career development opportunities for young people. We firmly believe that investing in our young people is the solution to not only addressing the chronic unemployment challenge that we are facing here on the continent, but also to advance these economies and to strengthen the continent at large. One hundred thousand by the year 2020. That's how many lives we aim to change with our sustainable empowerment program. Every year, we place more than 3,000 previously disadvantaged youth into jobs. Every month, more than 400 applicants are accepted and trained free of charge. It is a call to action for each and every one of us to see how it is that we can contribute to getting young people off the streets and integrated into the private sector. It somehow organically encourages a level of innovation on the African continent in terms of applying solutions in the job space. The unemployment rate in South Africa is astronomical and you know my aim was to come and see um, the work that's being done by Career Box. And on being in Durban, seeing people queuing in the street just to get an interview, you know, really hit it home for me. People aren't finding opportunities to work done the studying, they, they've been on courses and all of a sudden they've worked for two or three years to get qualified and all of a sudden there's nothing there for them. I have to say that I've seen nothing like Career Box. It really is a wonderful structure and possibly something that should be institutionalized throughout Africa to empower its youth and to really give them access to opportunity. So we extend this message to many youth, come and be a part of this. Support us and we'll support you. Let's combat this challenge of unemployment. But these kids now have a pathway that they provide for their parents, they provide for their brothers and sisters. They set a new whole barrier that opens up to a much bigger community. The time to be anything, to become anything, is now. We do not have the luxury of time not to do something now. They all want to be part of a global solution and we must work together collectively to give them that opportunity. Today is the day that makes a difference. Today we can make a change. Today we can acknowledge and celebrate our joint legacy by empowering our youth. One day, 
at a time. One job at a time. One person at a time. To say that this is a privilege is an understatement. Uh, to moderate a conversation with you, Zonda, uh, and to host the Mandela Legacy Foundation. Uh, as the chairman of the Mandela Legacy Foundation, Zonda has a unique understanding of sustainable social intervention. As the grandson of Nelson and Winnie Mandela, uh, Zonda has inherited the responsibility a tremendous responsibility, I might add, of continuing his grandparents' lifelong pursuit of equality, human rights, and equal opportunity for all. The Mandela Legacy Foundation is committed to carrying on these ideals and is charged with continuing to fight for those beliefs. Together with partners like the Houston Area Urban League, and others. He strives to catalyze and scale transformative innovations, create unlikely partnerships that will span sectors and take risks others cannot or will not. For more than 10 years, the Mandela Legacy Foundation's mission has been to develop solutions and partnerships that can improve the lives of Africans. Zonda's immediate focus is to create a future for African youth by providing hope, guidance, and most importantly, opportunity through job creation. Zonda, again, it is a tremendous uh, pleasure to make your introduction and to host you here at the Houston Area Urban League. You heard earlier about the Center for Social Justice, yes. and when we launched it, it was a physical space uh, in our Angel Lane Community Center. But for us, the Center for Social Justice and Education is a space that can exist wherever we prop it up, wherever we have an opportunity to engage with others, individuals like yourself, uh, that we can advocate for underserved communities. You know, as I read through the Mandela Legacy Foundation overview, yeah. there was a lot of continuity with the mission of the Houston Area Urban League to empower African Americans and other minorities to secure economic self-reliance parity, power, and civil rights. And so as has been stated, we look forward to developing a deeper relationship with you uh, and your partner organizations and working with you in the future. But again, just a tremendous privilege, sir. Eric, uh, thank you so much. Um, it's a pleasure being here. Uh, you know, one has been on a very long journey. Um, so such encounters that allow us to express the mission, um, share ideas, and um, plan for a greater future for you know, the communities we serve um, will always be an opportunity that one um, takes with great pride. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. <clears throat> now we've, uh, we've touched on some of uh, the initiatives, yeah. uh, the goals and objectives of the foundation and certainly the video uh, clearly portrayed what that looks like real time. Sure. But tell us about some of the pillars that exist under the Mandela Legacy Foundation, and then those things that you are doing currently uh, to innovate and to address, as you termed, uh, a pandemic of unemployment yeah. in South Africa. So, I mean, I, I think before I actually even get into that, what I would actually like to extend or touch on is in fact that particular video. Um, you know, that video is always very moving because it actually involves people that were very close to me who were the cornerstone and centerpiece of this particular mission that we have been on for several years, and that would be my grandmother and my mother. Now, in many instances, you know, I'm really not one for um, corporate videos, right? But in a situation where, you know, words are not enough, mm -hmm. in a situation where we've got language barriers, right, I believe in art as a medium of, of exchange, right? 
um, because with art, with illustration, we have an ability to communicate things without, you know, the barriers that might be there if we speak different languages. Absolutely. And so that particular video then becomes very critical in communicating our message. But just a step further, you know, in the sense that what we're trying to capture is something that is very real. We're trying to capture a challenge that is real within South Africa, within Africa, and in many other parts of the world. I think this is a global phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And what we're then trying to say is that we're capturing the issue at hand, but we are also providing a solution. And that is really what this particular video is describing. <clears throat> and in that solution, I think people will always ask, is this real? Is it authentic? And funny enough, um, I remember posting this video. Now, we, we had recorded this particular video maybe seven years ago or something. Yeah. And um, about three weeks ago, I, I took the liberty and posted it, because, you know, it's just, just a point of, you know, uh, as remembrance. And the video played, several people watched it, I guess reacted to it. But if you recall, in that particular video, there's a young gentleman called Lungelo, who in fact is telling his story. And he opens up by indicating that, you know, his family has been moved out of home. This is the second home they're about to be kicked out of. And in, in the response to the post that I made, there was a young gentleman that wrote under this particular video, and his name was Lungelo. In fact, it was a gentleman in that particular video. Mm -hmm. And in his response, he then says, I'd like to thank Mandela Legacy Foundation. I'd like to thank Career Box, because now I'm, in fact, buying a house for my mother. Wow. You know? Exactly. So it's, um, you know, that particular moment just really went full circle for me in the sense that sometimes you may not see the impact of what it is that we're doing, but there'll be the unique moments where the vision of ensuring that people are economically independent and can fend for themselves will, will is, is in fact a solution to address unemployment and many other issues. Absolutely. Thank we you. call that somewhat a ripple effect. And, exactly, and exactly. the work that we yeah. do, we have uh, something that we call the Urban League story. Yeah. Uh, yeah. As you are aware, as an organization, we provide a holistic set of services in housing, education, workforce development, and small business. And so sometimes it's not the immediate touch point. Correct. It's those things that happen Correct. a year down the road Correct. that allows the individual and the families to become self-sufficient. Exactly. So again, a lot of intersections yeah. within our organizations. And, and then, so now to get back to your actual question, right? Certainly. Yeah. Um, so our primary focus as an organization is that we're, we're literally addressing, like I indicated, unemployment, right? Unfortunately, South Africa currently has one of the highest unemployment rates, right? I think currently we've probably got a headline unemployment rate of 38%. And if you dig deeper into that particular demographic and you look at youth specifically, right? If we're looking at youth 15, age to 34, you're looking at an unemployment rate of 47%. That's staggering. Which is, in yes it is, right? And if you then dig deeper into that particular um, number, you're looking at an unemployment rate of at least 60% of young black women, right? So the most impacted are young black women, who I believe are the primary contributors to ensuring and guaranteeing a mobile society, right? An upwardly mobile society. So one of the primary things that we're actually trying to address is unemployment, and we do so by focusing on our first pillar, which is job creation. Mm -hmm. And we've had to identify sectors that can give us the necessary jobs at a rate at which unemployment is growing, right? Certainly. And we've identified sectors such as the BPO sector, which mm -hmm. is business process outsourcing, and for many other people that are not aware, um, is a fancy word for call centers, right? So the BPO sector mm -hmm. is one of those industries that has the potential not only to employ 100 people, 1,000 people, but we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people just overnight, right? Absolutely. And so that's where we focus our energy on. The second pillar would then be women in leadership. I touched on those that are most impacted or affected rather as a result of unemployment mm -hmm. being women. 
And through a lot of the work that we do and the studies that we've had, um, we know that you know, by creating opportunity for women specifically, you're able to circulate at least 15% of money that people generate back into the home, right? Mm -hmm. And so naturally within our organization, we've got programs that lean more towards ensuring and guaranteeing equal participation for women within our organization. The third pillar would then be training and education. Mm-hmm. You know, when we're talking about creating opportunity for people, we're dealing with um, young people who have either never had a first-time job, mm-hmm. have never completed school, and you know, would not even know how to approach their first interview, right? So within this particular incubation piece, which is done through a program um, uh, called the Mandela Legacy Initiative Career Box, we train, upskill, and give young people the necessary tools, right? That they can, you know, they'll learn digital skills, soft skills, and a variety of other skills. But one of the things that we realized was a key to their development was actually the personal development that they undergo, right? The identification. Yeah. yeah. So we were instilling a sense of confidence in self that makes one believe that they actually belong, right? Because this is not a case of young people who are not capable. They've just never been given a fair opportunity. Certainly. Yeah. And then lastly, it would be financial literacy. I think when we're then talking about, you know, your first time job, your first time check, we need to at least ensure that for many other people, this first time check is not some sort of liability, but at least an opportunity for them to start generating wealth. So I think financial consciousness then becomes a very critical component and therefore it's our fourth pillar. Absolutely. You know, again, so much similarity. Um, First, when you look at uh, the populations that we serve here in Houston, Uh, in low to moderate income and underserved communities, again, when you drill down to the youth, the the unemployment number doubles. Yes. Maybe not uh, as aggressively as in South Africa, but it still still doubles. And so we oftentimes have an unemployment rate for that particular demographic at around 18 to 20 percent. And so we also look to help build capacities and uh, provide career pathways to jobs that provide livable wages, yeah. but also upward mobility. One of the things that you yeah. mentioned most interestingly is that the BPO, uh, as our president, Justin Robinson says, it's a clean job. Sure. So it's an opportunity for an individual to get into a professional environment and begin to hone those skills. Yeah. N- not not to, to disregard the, the manual labor, because we also provide training and job placement in construction, but sure. the clean job provides um, potentially a more long-term stable environment, especially when you focus on the female demographic, yeah. for them to begin to generate money, as you said, bring it into the household, the ripple effect into the community, and then to become uh, long-term uh, self-sufficient individuals. Yeah. And, and, you know, when you look at um, <clears throat> the sector, you know, the call center industry, I think it's always earned this negative, um, it has this very negative history, right? So for us, it was also really around correcting that particular image, mm-hmm. you know, because it is one of the very few sectors that actually have few barriers to entry, you know. Um, In many instances, like I said, you don't need to have had a job previously. Um, Yes, you need to maybe have completed school. In some cases, that's not the case. So the point is, it is an opportunity that is easily accessible. Mm -hmm. But to take it then a step further, you know, we need to ensure that people are at least getting into opportunities that care for them as much as that opportunity is important for them, right? Yes. So at each, at each and every given point, someone needs to feel as if, yes, it's a first time job, but it's actually an opportunity to a career path, right? So even from a training and um, a, a, a upskilling point of view, we try and show within that particular career trajectory, we're able to upskill an individual, mm-hmm. give them new directives, take them into a different path, 
so that you know, you know, they're able to genuinely look at that as a as a career path rather than just a first time job. Absolutely. Yeah. You know, a, co a couple of things. I uh, really like the term career box because it speaks to a takeaway that the individual can have as a toolkit, yeah. something that they can always access that has resources that help build their their capability. Sure. So talk about the um, that social emotional learning and how you really train or help people to feel like they belong within that corporate environment. And then what are some of those arteries that help them build capacity? I, I know, you know, it's the identification, uh, the engaging others, uh, having appropriate communication skills, but what, what, yeah. what else does that look like for you? You know, I, I wish at this particular point I had one of our, um, you know, trainers here in the sense that it's, it's very good to kind of see the expression, you know, we've got classes that range from a week to four weeks to eight weeks. It's, um, it's a seven stage process, but it's very interesting to see someone evolve during that particular course, right? Yes. The person that came in at day one, who was unable to look at you in the eyes, who was unable to communicate. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, you'll hear some scary stories where someone even had to borrow a white shirt in order for mm -hmm. them to appear for work for their first interview. Because that is our notion of a first interview, you know, being your white shirt and some black pants. You know, right. so, and we can't assume many people own those, right? Certainly. And so now you're talking about an individual that is either, yes, belongs to a particular community, but may not belong in a space where they were previously isolated and not allowed to be a part of, right? So by virtue of them being with other colleagues in a, in a space which is um, designed to bring out the best in them, mm -hmm. in a space where they've got um, uh, uh, equal partners on a very similar journey seeking the same thing, I think that then makes them feel very comfortable, right? So it obviously then becomes a very safe space. Exactly. And as a result of that being a safe space, that's when the engagement can then take place, right? Um, and you know, our trainers are, are, are well equipped in, in, in so many skill sets, but the primary objective is to just get people communicating, is to get people feeling like they belong, and um, to give people the belief that, look, at the end of this particular process, there's a job at the end of this line. And one of the things that we also just ensure is that during that particular training and incubation period, it's actually the responsibility of the student to continue to bring themselves there. So I think you've then dealt with the one element that, or rather the most important element is that they're committed to that particular journey. So their commitment being, made, being met with some great support, I think is a, is a, is a marriage made in heaven. Absolutely. Yeah. And there's really no way to discount the peer-to-peer -peer support Correct. and the peer-to-peer -peer engagement. We found that to be invaluable in our processes. Correct. So as, 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 you, as you get people, you train them, you upskill them, you employ them, and then what is that, the, long, the, the long game? I mean, do you then complement that with, you said financial literacy, but is it, is it home buying or asset attainment? What, what, what does that, that long-term pathway look like that the foundations might support? You know, I think when we, when we speak of the long game, I'd rather kind of move the conversation away from the particular individual we're speaking of because the long game itself then requires us as an organization to be a lot more reflective from a bird's eye view as to, okay, are we really making a difference when we're talking unemployment, right? Mm -hmm. So as much as I've mentioned that the, the primary objective is addressing unemployment and we do that by creating jobs. But from a methodology point of view, our organization prefers to be impactful at each and every key stage of one's developmental life, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because as much as we're dealing with unemployment, the reality is that if we do nothing to address the, the environment in which continues to breed, un, breed unemployment, we're really not going to be making much of a difference, right? So we've got um, you know, various programs that focus on um, early childhood development, 
primarily around improving the level of literacy of children aged between 4 to 12. We've got some career development initiatives for young people at school. Um, because I think sometimes we waste time in not actually giving people the necessary tools whilst they're in school to kind of start following their dreams, right? Sure. And then when we then also speak of unemployment, unemployment has become such a major issue that it actually has no, um, it has no status now. So you can't say the have-nots are the only ones affected by unemployment. The reality is that you've got highly educated, um, young, privileged people with accessibility who are currently unemployed, right? So we then also have a program that, that connects youth in Africa to global opportunities across the world. Mm. So then what I'm trying to address is that at the end of the day, we want to have a holistic approach in addressing unemployment so that it actually is more sustainable Yes, for the individual that we're giving a job, but to ensure that at least in the future to come, um, we continue to breed candidates that are actually job ready, confident, even before they face issues of unemployment. You know, Zanwa, what, what you describe um, specific to what you're doing in South Africa, uh, again, is so uh, consistent with the African-American experience. You know, we continue to uh, evolve as communities while at the same time uh, always finding ourselves, if, if that makes sense. And so uh, a lot of the programs that urban leagues provide across the country uh, are designed for that same capacity building exercise through the holistic set of services and all of the core areas that I've mentioned. One of the assets that we have is our cultural competence. Yeah. So the people that we are training, that we're serving, they look like us. Yeah. And so I can only imagine that the foundation uh, also finds itself in that unique space because you are serving your own communities. Yeah. And talk about how your clients um, embrace that and, and, and use it as a measure to really then accelerate the process of that get them to where they might desire to be. Look, the, you know, one of the realities we live in is that it continues to be our people who are left behind, right? When I say our people, I mean black people within various communities, right? Countries move on but leave a specific few behind who do not get to benefit from the upward mobility that opportunity can create, right? So. Inherently, we are also intentional about the communities in which we're trying to affect change, right? We, in many instances, have established centers that are, for obvious reasons, in, in major districts within a city, business districts, because that would make uh, you know, one of your big corporates very comfortable because you've actually addressed the issue of infrastructure, mm -hmm. security, and appeal, you know, these spaces look great, they look grand. But now the reality is that, are we then solving the issue? So intentionally, we've also then developed smaller training hubs in the communities in which they actually need it most, mm. right? And so that's- How spoke. Yeah, so, so, you know, we also are mindful of taking the opportunity to the people in order to continue to give them access and accessibility and so on. But then I'd also mention that we're dealing with people that are actually very capable, mm -hmm. young, brilliant minds. So what really stands out is that this is a very compatible human resource, right? And that's one of the things I'm actually quite proud of being from the African continent is that we've got something very unique and that is the innate talent of our people. So from a proposition point of view, it's very simple that I'm saying that We've got talented young people mm -hmm. who have an affinity to multiple of cultures, mm -hmm. who, can, who, who are easily understood because of their dialects, can understand a series of other dialects. So that becomes very appealing to an organization that is seeking um, you know, some level of you know, agents with, the, with a good affinity to their culture and objective. So inherently, um, you know, agents that understand their client, agents that are actually able to contribute well to their daily job and requirement, 
we'd like to then assume result in some sort of um, a positive outcome from a customer experience point of view. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So for a client that gets to experience that, I think that's really a, that's a real value prop that's a value proposition that you really can't beat or duplicate, right? Certainly. And so, the, literally, in a, in a free market economy, you know, I'm advocating to say that, you know, we would like to convince the rest of the world, especially English-speaking territories, to consider the outsourcing in Africa instead of India and the Philippines, right? And, you know, just by mentioning that, I think from an experience point of view, we're saying that the South African, or rather, let's say, we're saying the African youth and talent pool has the innate ability to actually even address emotional and complex issues mm -hmm. um, better than other spaces or territories if you'd like to compare apples with apples. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, after all, you're training people to be the front line that a customer engages with for major corporations. Yeah. Uh, I, as a very demanding customer, have had the experience. Of, I've heard uh, about Americans being yes. very demanding. Well, yeah. yes. <laughs> well, you know, we, we, we want it. Yeah. Then, yeah, if we have an issue, <laughs> we want to leave the call with it being addressed. Sure. And then we might also request some compensation for the yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. for the yeah, for the inconvenience. But yeah. you know, it's um, you know that that that's a difficult position for mm -hmm. young people to find themselves in. And so, just the the whole front end investment in training people to engage in all of those rigors yeah. uh, is is a value within itself. And then, of course, you know, this, this, the, the generations, the millennials and the, the gen, gen X, sure. you know, they have a very unique perspective yeah. uh, that, um, that I find to be really global. Yeah. So, you know, they, 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 they do not allow themselves to be boxed in and, and are looking at the world very, very differently. Correct. And Correct. so in that regard, uh, really provides a lot of opportunity for organizations like Mandela Legacy Foundation to work with organizations that might be here in the States like Urban Leagues and others. But tell us a little about the partnerships that you have that allow you to facilitate the job creation and then those, those career okay. pathways. Sure. So um, before I go there, there's, there's something you touched on around um, uh, the ability to deal with customers. And there's a story, right, um, that I recall in relation to that. So, um, you know, there's uh, one of the clients we service are, um, what, how would you, a, a digital TV provider? Yes. Yeah, that's the best way to put it. Mm -hmm. And um, so this lady, right, this um, lady, I'm not sure her age, maybe her age is irrelevant, right? Mm -hmm. She calls in and um, a young gentleman answers the phone. And so she has an issue, right? She's got like four kids, right? Mm -hmm. And I think the call was that she actually wanted to cancel her subscription. So she called and she's like, hey man, you know, this is just, it's just not working. You've told me to get extra this, extra that, because my husband likes to watch this on this particular occasion. Then I've got two kids that like to watch this and I've got two other kids that watch, you know, want to watch different things. So she's like, you know, at this rate, I think I just need to cancel, cancel. the subscription. Certainly. And you know what the young guy said? He said, no, but have you actually not thought about getting rid of your other kids? <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and, oh and, and, and to me, that was something, you know, that was something That's very unique. Certainly. You, you can't buy that, Eric. You know what I'm saying? You know, you can't buy that. And um, I'm almost certain oh she my. kept her subscription. Oh. They just modified it, you know Certainly. what I'm saying? So, so um, you know, so, so that's really the unique thing, and it happens in the most uh, random way, but these are, these are lessons that actually then say that, guys, we've got something special, and we should never take it for granted. Um, now, collaboration, I think, to me, is, is very critical mm -hmm. in um, a space where you understand that we're actually we're dealing with a pandemic, right? Um, we've been capable to do a lot on our own, but in order to be instrumental, impactful, and effective, it's very important for us to partner with the right people, 
whether it's from a technical point of view, because I, I'm also a believer in, in not reinventing the wheel. Certainly. And the reality is that as a brand, as a, you know, as a family, as individuals, as leaders within our organization, we also bring a lot of value to other organizations that seek to align and create advocacy through our organization. Certainly. So, wait so, yeah. so you, when you say pandemic, you're, you're speaking of the unemployment. Unemployment pandemic. Because, right, absolutely. And, and, and this is just a reality, mm -hmm. right? I think before COVID, we were actually dealing with a pandemic of unemployment. Exactly. Right? And many others that have continued to affect um, a lot of black communities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so to that, um, you know, collaboration becomes very critical. Further to that, um, you know, I think collaboration between countries and continents and, you know, communities that sit in different parts of the world then becomes also, excuse me, very significant, right? Mm -hmm. The reason why, you know, we come here as often as we do, uh, myself and together with our partners, is to advocate for, um, you know, a certain level of intervention that, you know, we're trying to say that, yes, we're capable of creating a certain amount of jobs, but that amount of jobs is not going to come solely from South Africa, right? Mm -hmm. So if we're speaking to the American community, we know that there are many business leaders here. Um, there's yourselves, right? There's organizations that have seen the importance of what it means when you're able to support a country that's experiencing human rights issues. And this will now even date back to um, the sanctions that a country such as the USA imposed when we were dealing with apartheid and the impact that had in Certainly. terms of allowing us to successfully fight for our rights and freedom, right? And post that, we've got the issues that we're dealing with now and we need to find unique ways to address this issue of unemployment by creating sustainable and viable opportunities for young people to actually make money, right? So in the context of the Africa and USA relationship, the reality is very simple. There are a lot of jobs that I believe America continues to outsource, has outsourced and will well, either these jobs will remain outsourced. Mm -hmm. And so the conversation is very simple that we are talking about having access to those jobs that would likely never even make themselves back to the American shore. But the point is, how do you guarantee that those jobs go to the communities that need them most, right? Certainly. And it's really just that mindset that we just need to correct because I think as these, as, as our organization sit here, as the people, you know, as people listen, right? Our primary objective now is really to collectively make a difference, but ensure that it is sustainable and we can feel it, touch it, and know that it's tangible and it's actually having the necessary ripple effect that we foresee. Absolutely. My vision is very simple. I believe in an Africa that is focused on trade and not aid. Mm. Mm. And by virtue of the fact that Africa will one day become or rather have the largest population in the continent, at least by 2050, we can all collectively decide whether is that going to be a liability or an opportunity for the rest of the world, right? Certainly. So collaboration, in order for us to have scale, in order for us to ensure that these ideas are accessible, um, working together, formulating new partnerships, extending the scope of the vision, sharing ideas, then becomes a critical part of the conversation. Yes, I mean, and you know, it's, it's a matter of looking at it as an opportunity and not a challenge to mitigating the barriers that prevent the people we serve from obtaining those things that they desire that work for themselves and their families. You know, one of the conversations that uh, we have on just on an ongoing basis, uh, my colleague Romel Williams and I just this morning, how do you take a challenging situation but then identify what are the real solutions and, and then creating a narrative that speaks to the fact that you've been very intentional and in not just looking at the situation, the problem, but what you can do to, to, to really be of assistance and to help and to move those individuals into a different space.
Um, I know we're, we're coming on, on our close, just a couple of questions. So what is the, um, what is the moonshot for the Mandela Legacy Foundation? If, if, if capital were not an issue, if logistics were not an issue, what is, that, what is that moonshot that you desire and what is the timeline that you would like to see that occur? Um, to create a million jobs by 2030. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And um, the reason I say this is because, you know, my, um, you know, when my grandfather came out of jail, right, and became the first black president, you know, in, in a single decision, in a single moment in time, he was able to impact the lives of billions of people across Absolutely. the world, right? So if I'm talking about a million, I don't think it's too difficult. Um, it's too difficult an objective to reach. Yeah. You know, when um, looking at that from the outside and <clears throat> just seeing how eloquent your grandfather was and gracious and how he dealt with that was just amazing. Mm -hmm. um, having the mental fortitude and the compassion to deal with something like that that was just uh, so egregious to him personally, but to your family, uh, I cannot imagine um, how he, he, he did that. And so just, you know, when you, when you look at the Mandela legacy, that is the thing that becomes, I mean, that just so immediate in my mind, mm. just, just an amazing uh, story and testimony within yeah. itself. And if the, that does not provide an example, yeah of what is possible to anyone, regardless of where they are, I don't know what is. True, true. And so, I guess, what, what would be the last nugget that you would like to share as we bring back up uh, Chairman Guidry and President Robinson to, to close us out? That one thing that you would like to leave our listening audience with, you know, and I understand that uh, we, we have a, a good crowd listening, uh, okay. And for those participants that have also been able to join us uh, via Facebook, but I mean, when you say Mandela, it is an immediate draw. So it's a, it's a good thing. We'll, we'll try and ensure that it continues to be a good, a good draw card. Absolutely. Um, you know, I think w one of the things that we're speaking about two very great icons, you know, in reference to. Um, you know, my grandparents, and icons to the world, yes. right? It's also very important to understand that, you know, as much as we can view them as icons, these were two young people from the African soil who grew up in families that loved them, in families, you know, that were of a family structure that we are all very familiar with, Right? So our responsibility also as an organization and why we believe um, we should be impacting <clears throat> young people's lives and, and setting a different trajectory for the journey of their lives is because in each and every one, they need to understand that they too are living icons, right? Mm. And I often, you know, if I'm speaking to, you know, younger people, and I speak to, my, you know, on my grandparents in many instances, I think the objective is not to idealize them, right? But it is for people to attach themselves very strongly to that particular legacy, mm -hmm. to that particular journey, and understand that its success is a byproduct of who they are. So if anything, I think it's for people to see the inner greatness that they represent and to always believe in that. That's beautiful. Yeah. I mean, that simply says that each of us has a contribution to society. Yeah. Each individual can be an icon should they desire to esteem something bigger than themselves yeah. and certainly have a, a compass, if you will. I mean, it's, I mean Zwanda, it's, it's very difficult not to idolize and glamorize your grandparents. I mean, just again, 
just an overwhelming story and narrative, and, and those are for people looking from afar. But you know, as we just continue to provide services through the Center for Social Justice and Education, uh, we just finished our first cohort that was facilitated by you know, our partner, uh, young Ray Shackelford. He did a masterful job in really addressing uh, city, uh, county, state politics, mm -hmm. really kind of touching on some of the areas that are part of the advocacy that we look to facilitate. Uh, but this offering and the privilege to host you through the center has been indeed a pleasure. Thank you for entrusting us with a platform that allows us to have this authentic type of discussion. Uh, thank you for your investment of time and for bringing your partners here uh, to contribute to the dialogue. We also want to thank our partners from Ashurian and our local contact, Mr. Abel Ryan, for helping to coordinate this activity. And just for everyone that contrib contributed to the presentation, uh, we really appreciate it. Uh, without further ado, so we're much. going to, to have uh, our chairman, Mr. Calvin Guidry, and our president, Justin Robinson III, come and bring the, uh, the session to a close. Thank you so much. Thank you. Absolutely. Great talking. Thank My you. pleasure. Americans have an expression, uh, the apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I cannot tell you how engaging, intelligent, but your ability to express your vision so that we can all see it, understand it, and understand how we can contribute has made us better. Uh, we were all sitting there just shaking our heads like, this man is impressive. <laughs> what we understand most though, what we understand most is that your vision is attainable. Not only is it attainable, but it is our obligation to help. So we thank you for your time. We thank you for your brilliance. But in particular, we thank you for expressing your vision so that our entire audience not only participated, but understood it, and will grow from it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank our participating audience, those on Zoom, those on FaceTime Live, uh, our participants here. Prior to us actually doing this, we actually met together and talked about some of the things that, that we could collaborate on and understood uh, what organizations were contributing. Assurance is doing an outstanding job of, of absolutely understanding our mission, our vision, and our ability to execute on that and they stand up with their dollars. So we have to thank them in particular. We are long-term partners. Uh, I would like to ask Mr. Robinson, because we have an awful lot of partners that have participated, to thank them. Thank you, Mr. Guidry, and uh, again, Zanwa, thank you so much for uh, coming to Houston to uh, partner with Assurian and you know, it, it helps our other partners to really see the value in the center uh, led by Mr. Shackelford. So you know, those who uh, put money into the Urban League, uh, like Cadence Bank, uh, like Coca-Cola, like PNC, and the many others that uh, help to make sure that we're in a position to do this, it's, um, it's the wind beneath my wings, truly, uh, to have qualified leaders like Eric Goody and Mr. Shackelford and Romel Williams, uh, our staff, Lorraine Williams, uh, Winslow, we're just fortunate that this team comes together and puts forth the effort necessary to ensure that when you hear about the Urban League, we are a trusted partner. To have 200 some odd other agencies that you took a look at and said, um, you know, we want to come and work with the Urban League, that's why we do the work. That's why we're here every day making sure that people like yourself and others see us as quality partners because we have a lot of responsibility to the world. A million people that need a job and beyond. Um, you know, we are the stewards right now. And so it's up to us to be creative thinkers, to be visionaries, and to bring those talents together. People like yourselves and people like these and others. 
that have ideas about how we can solve this problem because the problem is huge. But through dialogue, through discussion, through trial and error, we'll get there. So again, Zanwa Mandela, thank you for joining the Houston Area Urban League. Let's give him a hand again. <laughs> I would also like to direct uh, our participants in the viewing audience to the Urban League website at www.haul.org. Uh, you can reach us at any of our offices here at the, the downtown location, uh, 5260 Griggs or our Angel Lane Community Center. Uh, we are here to serve. So our new, newly enhanced website uh, will provide a drill down of all of the programs, how you can uh, get connected, uh, how you can become a member, a sponsor, uh, or how you can become a beneficiary of the tremendous work that we're doing here in the Houston market. So again, that's H-A-U-L dot O-R-G. And Mr. Mandela, the website that you'd like us to um, So to. that would be uh, Mandela Legacy dot foundation. So that is a website and um, Instagram is at Mandela Legacy. Twitter is at Mandela Legacy. And then, the world is at Mandela Legacy. Yeah, that's, uh, that's <laughs> at Mandela Legacy, at Mandela Legacy. <laughs> but yeah, uh, um, Mandela Legacy dot foundation. Yeah, Very thank good. you so much. Very good. With that, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your attendance. Thank you for participating and supporting the legacy of the Mandela family and the foundation, and of course, your Houston Area Urban League. Thank you and good night.